you for joining us today on Tuesday. This is the third Tuesday of the month, so it's Audubon Tuesday. Um, Mary Ann is out of the country and Milo is also unable to make it, um, but I believe that we start off with birds, bird sightings, right? I'll speak bald eagles. Bald eagles, what did you see, Bob? Osprey. Osprey. Right. Cool. Where did you see those? Up on the ski hill this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. South. Yeah. Heading somewhere. <laughs> oh. What else? Anyone else see anything exciting? Seagulls. I can see Bubblehead in the, the slough behind AC. Three inches of powder snow up at top station. <laughs> Excellent. Gotta get out the powder skis soon. Um, all right, tonight we have um, Alexandra Russo, who recently um, has been in Africa. She's been there for two separate projects, and she's going to speak about her work and some of the issues that uh, she and her colleagues were working on in East Africa. So I'd like to introduce um, Ali Russo. Hi. <laughs> And I was invited to speak to you guys today about my experience is experiences in Eastern Africa. So, oh. um, I've been really fortunate to have the opportunity to travel actually three times to Africa. The first time I went to South Africa, uh, the second time I went to Tanzania and Kenya, and then the third time I was in Tanzania. So I'm gonna talk mostly about my time in East Africa. The first time I went, I was doing a semester study abroad program. I was there for about five months total and my time was split between Tanzania and Kenya. I went with the School for Field Studies. Um, it's an environmentally focused program and we studied wildlife conservation and environmental policy in those two countries. Uh, my school was located right, so right outside of Arusha near Lake Manyara National Park. and um, that's my school. <laughs> this area is known as the Northern Tourist Circuit, which is made up of the Serengeti National Park, Ngorogoro Crater, Tarangiri, and Lake Manyara. And that's sort of where everybody who is traveling to Tanzania to view wildlife, that's sort of where they go because there's such a high density of wildlife in such a small area. And all the people that are constantly moving in and out of the area make it um, a really interesting area for ecologists to study. So my Kenya location, or my Kenya campus was located right at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro, so right on the other side of the border. Kilimanjaro is in Tanzania, but I was like right there. And that area is known as Maasai land because the Maasai tribe um, is the dominant one in the area. And that is the view from my school. I was really lucky I could look outside my window and see Kilimanjaro every morning. And no, I didn't climb it. And no, I have no interest in climbing it. <laughs> um, so the sec oh, and that was in 2011, my study abroad program. So earlier this year, for um, six months, I was interning for a British conservation organization. And I was living right outside of Ifakara, right along this road, on, in a small village called Igota. And that's sort of the main street of Igota. It's a pretty typical Tanzanian village. Um, not, uh, some buildings had electricity, but most didn't. A lot of buildings were powered by generator, mostly thatched roof buildings and tin roof buildings, if you can call them buildings. Um, and this is just a typical Tanzanian shop, a lot of odds and ends that they buy from the Salvation Army and like goodwill items that get shipped over, they kind of pick them up and then sell them again. Uh, my colleagues and I, we sort of had this goal that every time we found one of these shops, we would look through to see if anything we had ever donated turned up, but no luck. Um, and sorry, this is kind of a blurry picture, but this is Dar es Salaam. It's not the political capital, it's known as the business capital, but everyone's sort of surprised that there's a city this big in Tanzania, and this is actually where you have to fly into to get anywhere in the country. So to get to Igota, which is where I lived, I flew in here. And then from there, you can either take a small commercial flight, a charter plane, or a bus. And so this is a standard bus, uh, standard bus ride anywhere in Tanzania, usually just dirt roads. 
And it's not like in the US where it's two seats and two seats. It's three seats and two seats. And there's no such thing as full. So as you drive along the road, they, someone puts their hand up. Everyone just shoves back. And you know they just pack as many people and chickens and children on as they possibly can. And the roads are bumpy. The buses are old. When you hit a pothole, everybody jumps three feet in air. And you fling into the seat in front of you. And it's just an awful 10-hour bus ride. Um, this is where I lived. We didn't have electricity, but the villages to either side of us did, but for some reason we never got hooked up to the power grid. So we cooked all of our food on a campfire. Um, those were our living conditions, pretty basic. We had mosquito nets because malaria was really common where we were living. I think at least once every other week, one of our neighbors came down with malaria. But it's pretty typical for them. They kind of view it as the common cold, like, oh, he has malaria again. He's going to stay home from school today. So it's really not too big of a deal to them. but. Actually, to go into the country, you have to be on some type of anti-malarial. Don't ask me how many I came home with, because I definitely didn't take my pill every day. Um, so we didn't have electricity, so this was sort of our power source. It's three solar panels, an old car battery, and a power strip. And that's how we charged our cell phones. Um, it's our bathroom, pretty basic. Um, this is the school. It's pretty typical for, well, it's typical for all public school students to wear uniforms. And one of the reasons that their literacy rate is so low and that so many students don't perform well in school is because while they're at home being raised, they learn their tribal language. And there are over 130 different tribes in Tanzania, and each has its own local dialect. So they learn that at home, and then they go to primary school, which is the equivalent of elementary school. And then they're taught all of a sudden in Swahili with English as a subject. And then they start secondary school, which is like high school. And then they're taught everything in English with Swahili as a subject. So not only are they trying to learn the material, but they're trying to learn the new language that all the material is being taught in. And that's one of the reasons that so many children don't perform well in school. Um, just a typical market in Tanzania. Everything is locally grown, unless you're in one of the big cities like Dar or Arusha you only are going to get what's in season locally. So sometimes you can walk in and there'll be all kinds of things, and other times you'll walk in and there'll be some tomatoes and a couple small potatoes. So you're either really lucky or you're really unlucky. So this is sort of what I'm going to be focusing on tonight. This is one of my coworkers um, from earlier this year. And what he's doing is he is putting in a signpost to mark land use boundaries. and. The reason he's doing this is because one of the projects I was working on was setting up a wildlife management area. And right now in Tanzania, they're kind of experiencing a shift in the way wildlife is managed. Traditionally, the national government has been responsible for managing and controlling all of the natural resources in the country. But recently, they, well, over the last few years, they've noticed that their current system isn't working for a variety of reasons. And that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about tonight. And they're switching from uh, keeping the power in the hands of the national government to giving the power back to the people. So, so just some background on Tanzania. It was originally a German colony, and it was Germany that passed the first laws on um, you know, what you could hunt, when you could hunt it, how you could hunt it, and how many of various animals you could hunt. And Germany also set aside the first protected area, and that's what is today the Salu Game Reserve. And then later, Tanzania became a British mandate. And it was Great Britain that established the game department, which set the precedent for the current um, wildlife management associations. And they also established the Serengeti Game Reserve, what is today Serengeti National Park. And the way that both of these protected areas were established were the Europeans came in, and they found a plot of land that had a really high density of wildlife. And they sort of mapped out where they wanted the boundaries to be. And then they just evicted everybody, all the natives that live there. And they didn't compensate them in any way. Uh, so in the case of the Serengeti, the people that traditionally lived there were the Maasai. And this is the Maasai. They're kind of the, they're like the most well-known tribe. They're sort of the one that come to mind when people think of a traditional African lifestyle. Um, and they are actually one of not one of the few tribes, but one of the tribes that still actively practice um, a lot of their traditions. 
And their culture is really interesting because the, pe oh, the men in the, the tribes particularly, they sort of pass through these stages of life. So this picture right here is a Maasai warrior, which is sort of like every man's goal is to become a Maasai warrior. Um, and these are junior warriors, and they have to go through all these different rituals to sort of become a man. And when you, s you see them all the time along the side of the road in this black and then these white masks, and that's them going through their rite of passage, which involves sort of like, I, I don't know, like a extended stay in the bush. Um, they get circumcised, and it's a really big deal, and that's sort of what they all strive to do is become uh, Maasai warriors. And the Maasai are also known for their jewelry. It's a really big hit with the tourists. They stand outside the national parks and along the side of the road selling all this jewelry. And it's a really good way for them to make money rather than going in the woods and cutting down trees and hunting illegally. Um, so, so when the British established the Serengeti, they kicked all the Maasai into what is today the Ngorogoro Conservation Area and they kicked them out of the Serengeti and into the Ngorogoro Highlands. I'll talk more about the conservation area later because it's a really, interest, uh, really interesting type of protected area. So this is the Highlands. This is just outside of Ngorogoro Crater. To get to the crater, you kind of drive up through the mountains and then you pretty much just drive straight down into the crater. It's a really pretty area, um, a lot of rolling hills. And this is down into the crater. The crater, I think it's something like 100, and square, uh, 100 square miles. Uh, it was caused when a volcano imploded on itself. I can't tell you when. I can't really tell you the details of how either. There is one lake in the crater. It's one of the few permanent year-round water sources. So a lot of animals migrate, particularly in the dry season, to the crater. Um, and another thing that you guys should know about Tanzania is that there are no fences around the national parks. I don't know if you've been to South Africa or any other African countries, but um, in South Africa, all the parks are fenced in. So you can be driving along the highway and you can look to your right and there'll be a shopping mall and you can look to your left and there'll be a 10 foot high electric fence that says danger, keep out, lions. Um, but in Tanzania, there's not really anything like that. So the wildlife can come and go in and out of the park as they please. And so what typically happens is during the rainy season, the animals leave the park because they're, sorry, <laughs> there are sources of water everywhere. Whereas in the dry season, uh, the permanent sources of water tend to be only in the park, so the animals will stay in the park. And so what we see is during the rainy season, when there's a lot more flexibility of where they can get water, 70% of the wildlife is found outside of the parks. And this causes a really big problem for villages located on the outskirts of national parks because there's nothing to keep the animals out of their villages and out of their farms. And another thing is that the government owns all land in the country. No businesses and no individuals can own land. The government can lease land to them, but at no time can um, an individual or company own land. And so the problem with this is that it's really hard to get local people to invest in the land because why would you invest in something that's not yours, especially when the government has set a precedent for seizing the land at their will. And the government also owns all wildlife. So even if you're a company that you know, is doing commercial farming down there and an elephant comes through and destroys all your crops, you have no right to retaliate in any sort of way. You have no right to remove the animal or chase the animal away because it's technically the government's property and the government's responsibility. Um, so that causes a really big feeling of resentment towards the national government because they don't always take accountability for these animals. Uh, as a developing country, Tanzania relies primarily on agriculture. 80% of people rely on small-scale farms. They're called shambas. That's a Swahili word for small farm. And usually people don't even grow enough to sell or trade. It's typically just enough to get by. Uh, forestry, fishing, and mining are also very important. Tanzania is known for its gold and its tanzanite. And tourism makes up it's somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of the total economy. So as you can see, the society as a whole depends a lot on natural resources. So because they are so dependent on natural resources, about 30 percent of the land in the country has been given some type of protective status. So right now there are 15 national parks. Um, the most well-known one is the Serengeti. 
um, I couldn't find one map that had all the protected areas, so we kind of have to flip between three of them. But then you have game reserves. The Salu is the most famous game reserve. It's also the single largest protected area in all of Tanzania. Um, you have the conservation area. You have a lot of national forests. And then you have this gray area, which are sort of community-run conservation areas. And I'll talk more about those in a bit. But just as you can see, there's a lot of protected area in the country. So the seven uh, classes of protected land, and this doesn't include any of the marine parks, you have national parks and you have game reserves, conservation areas, game controlled areas, forest reserves, private forest plantations, and wildlife management areas. And that's the project that I was working on earlier this year. So with national parks, there are 15 of them, like I said, and national parks are formed around areas with high biodiversity and their primary purpose is wildlife conservation. And you can, they're really strict about what you can and cannot do in a park, in a national park. They have, you have to pass security checkpoints to get in, you have to pay an entrance fee. Um, and while you're there, you can only drive through and take pictures. Um, and when you pay at the front gate, all that money goes to the national government. So this is Serengeti National Park. Serengeti is uh, Ma, which is the Maasai language for endless plains. And it's known for its high, or it's known sort of as a place to go view predators because they have such a high density of predator species there. And it's also really famous for <laughs> oh, this is pretty cool. This is called a uh, kopi, and this is sort of where the predators like to hang out because they get sort of a really good view. And you can kind of tell which species and which individuals are the dominant ones around because the dominant ones get the best views. So like the bigger the rock, um, the more dominant the species. So you usually see the male lions up here, and then you'll find cheetahs kind of hanging out on really small rocks because they're sort of at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of predators. But the Serengeti is really famous for the great wildebeest migration. And so the migration involves about 2,000 animals, and the majority of them are wildebeest. There's about 1.3 million wildebeest. And then there's not really a start or stop of the migration. It's continuous year round. And they follow the rains, and they follow the grasses. So they'll go through the conservation area up through the Serengeti, around sort of the outlying areas, up into Kenya, and then back down again. And in addition to the 2,000 migrating animals, you have a lot of the resident herbivores. So, you know, between the 2 million migrating and all the residents, that's a lot of animals. And then you have the predators, and they don't follow the migration, but if the migration is in their area, they tend to stick close to it. Because what happens is during January and February, all of the wildebeest give birth pretty much at the same time. So you get up to 4,000 calves being born within a couple of weeks, for weeks of each other. A lot of them don't make it. I think in total about 250,000 wildebeest die during the migration, and a lot of these deaths occur during river crossings. Particularly in northern Tanzania and Kenya, there are a lot of rivers up there, which especially for the calves, they're quite difficult to get through. Um, a lot of them are full of crocodiles and hippos, and then you have the predators on the banks. And it's not uncommon for a calf to cross two or three times, distressed looking for its mother, so a lot of them don't make it through. And this is actually, it's kind of a blurry picture, but this is actually what it's like to drive through the crater during the migration. It's just jam-packed with so many animals, you can hardly get through. You have to drive really slowly. You're not allowed to honk at them either, so it's just, whenever they feel like moving, then they'll let you through. So that was national parks, and then you have game reserves which cover 10% of the country's surface area. And one of the main differences between national parks and game reserves is that hunting is permitted in game reserves. Um, and the most famous of the, or the most well-known of the game reserves is the Salu. And they're particularly well-known because they're one of the few places that you are likely to see African wild dogs. I had a video, but I didn't download it. So I guess I don't have a video. But um, African wild dogs are pretty cool. They're pack animals. And you can find up to 30 or 40 in a pack. And the way they kill is they 
chase as a group, and then the, one of them grabs the animal, and then they just start ripping it apart. And it's, qu it's quite gruesome to see. I wish I had brought the video, but. <laughs> so then you have the conservation areas, and the Ngorogoro is the most famous one. And it's pretty unique because it wasn't established just to protect wildlife. It was also established to preserve archaeological sites and culture in water catchment areas. And like I said before, the Maasai tribe were moved into the conservation area when they got kicked out of the Serengeti. So usually in protected areas, they're, they're meant for wildlife conservation. But because the Maasai were sort of sent there, they're, I guess they're given like an exception. Um, and they're allowed to graze their livestock there. They're allowed to water their livestock there. And I think the only thing they're not allowed to do is farm. Um, and also in the conservation area is Old Duvai Gorge, which that is where the Leakeys found the hominid footprints. I think they named her Lucy. Was that it? Lucy, yeah. So the sort of earliest evidence of our human ancestors. Um, and then you have game controlled areas, which these are pretty unique too. They allow hunting and they allow human settlement. So typically what you'll find is a village will set aside some land and um, the national government will allow hunting on it. So this picture here is of a tourist who has gone to a game control area and he has hunt or he's uh, shot a buffalo. And I think when you think about it at first, it seems sort of counterintuitive to allow hunting when you're trying really hard to protect these animals. But hunting actually generates a lot of revenue for the national government. So just to give you an idea, it costs $100 a day to get into Serengeti National Park. Um, this figure right here is for a three-week trip. So if you spend three weeks in the Serengeti, you're going to spend just over $2,000 in park fees. Whereas if you go to hunt for three weeks, you're going to spend closer to $50,000. So hunting is not as common as game viewing, but it generates a lot more money. You also have forest reserves, and about 40% of the country's surface area is covered by woodlands, and then 13% of this um, are protected by government for, or are considered government reserves. And when you drive through Tanzania, there aren't very many roads to begin with, so sort of all the villages are lined up right along the roads. So as you're driving through, you're like, oh God, there must not be anywhere left. Like there must not be any free space because everything is so close to the road. But then when you get up on a mountain or if you get up on an escarpment and you look down, you can see just how much land there actually is left. And this is outside of the area, outside of the village where I was earlier this year. Um, and then you have private forest plantations. So this map here is from the Kilimbaro Valley Teak Company and that's one of the companies that contracted us to work for them earlier in the year. They grow teak, which is a tree. And I don't remember exactly how much land they have, but it's a pretty massive amount. And the way that their plantation works is only one third of their land is used for growing teak. And then the other two thirds are left, for, left in its natural state for wildlife conservation. And so in this area in particular, what we're seeing is that the area around the plantation is being cut down by the Sukuma tribe. They're a pastoralist tribe who's moving into the area and cutting down a lot of trees so that they can graze their, wild li or graze their livestock. So the area around this plantation is being completely destroyed. Um, and what's happening is the forest plantation is acting sort of, as a re sort of like a reserve especially to the elephants. So the elephants are fleeing to this forest plantation because it's the last place left while everything else is being cut down. Um, so now that I've told you sort of about the wildlife management areas, I'm just gonna ta talk to you guys briefly about kind of current events in wildlife management. And when you talk about them, it's really hard to break them up into categories because they all overlap and intertwine and affect one another. But for tonight's sake, we'll sort of break them into four categories. So we have human wildlife conflict, population growth, the bushmeat crisis, and expansion and development. So for those of you who don't know, human wildlife conflict is any interaction between a human and an animal that resolves in a negative impact on either the human or the animal. 
And so the, more, the four main types that you see in East Africa are livestock predation, crop raiding, attacks on humans, and attacks on animals. And livestock predation is when a predator animal goes into a village and hunts one of the cattle or one of the goats. It's not, it's not always lions, but they sort of have the worst reputation. A lot of the times it is hyena um, or leopards are quite guilty of it as well. And so what outside organizations are trying to do is develop ways to prevent this from happening. They've been giving local villages a lot of grants to develop these sort of predator-proof fences. And they are somewhat effective, but you can't stop it every time. And what happens quite often is when a predator animal does kill a livestock, the local villagers retaliate. And one of the ways that they've, they've been found to do this is by using a chemical called carbofurin, which is produced in the United States, but it's an insecticide. It's produced in the United States, but it's so toxic that it's not permitted. It's banned in the United States, but you can find it over there. And you can't smell it, you can't taste it. And they lace these carcasses with it. And the way carnivore animals feed is that they'll make the kill and they'll feed for a little while, and then they'll leave, and then they'll come back. But in that period while they're gone, the villagers lace the carcass with carbofurin. So the lions, for example, will come back and they'll bring their entire pride and they'll start feeding on this carcass. And they won't know that they're ingesting this chemical. And the chemical works by shutting down your nervous system, so they'll slowly just get paralyzed. And it will take out an entire pride in an hour. And this is also, that's not a very good picture, it's kind of blurry up there, but this is also a really big problem for birds of prey. Uh, vultures in particular will fly from miles around and hundreds of them will come to this carcass to feed and they won't know that they're ingesting this poison and they'll just start dropping. And so they've found that the vulture population is declining quite rapidly. One way they're trying to prevent this from happening is by getting the locals more involved in conservation efforts. So this particular project is called the Maasai Lion Guardians, and an organization has pulled together these funds to educate the Maasai warriors um, and to involve them in their conservation efforts. They hire the Maasai to use these satellites with them and go out and track the lions and study them so that the Maasai start to see the wildlife as more of uh, an or they just start to view them in more of a positive light and they learn about them rather than fear and detest them for constantly killing their livestock. So this here, this is crop raiding. This is a picture of a banana plantation that has been visited by an elephant. Elephants aren't the only one that crop raid, but they cause the most damage. Um, birds crop raid a lot. A lot of herbivores, browsers and grazers do it too, but the elephants are by far um, they, they cause by far the most damage. And a lot of times what happens is that locals retaliate. And this picture was actually taken outside of Amboseli in Kenya. But it's not uncommon to find elephants with wounds from spears or bows and arrows or knives <coughs> that uh, locals have used to try to chase them off. Uh, some of the methods that they use to try to prevent crop raiding, traditionally they, uh, they used a lot of noises like drums and dogs and they'd have 24 hour you know night watches or they'd light fires but that's, that sounds pretty exhausting so they started using electric fences but those are really expensive and they're really hard to maintain the Kilimbaro Valley Teak Company the company that I was doing some work for earlier they had all of their plantations surrounded by electric fences and they powered these electric fences with solar panels but when the locals realized that the solar panels could be used for other things besides charging electric fences, they started stealing the parts to you know, um, power their shops and power their homes and power their cell phones. So electric fences are pretty difficult. And when they get turned off, it's really easy for an elephant just to plow it right over. And then you have to start from scratch again. So one thing that they've recently found is that elephants really don't like bees. So they've been putting up these sort of bee-lined fences. That's a clearer picture. And what they'll do is when they hear or see an elephant coming, they'll pull and jiggle a rope and add or aggravate the bees. And then the bees will go out. And then the elephants won't want to come through because they really don't like bees. And elephants also really don't like chilies. 
So they'll line the fence with chili, and there have been reports of elephants sort of like backing into a fence with their trunk in the air, trying to get through, but trying to avoid the chili at the same time. They're both pretty new methods, so they haven't really come up with any conclusive results as to how effective they are, but they seem to be working so far. Um, and another way they are trying to kind of stop the retaliation towards animals is again to educate the locals and get them to embrace wildlife rather than hate it. Um, this is a picture of the Sheldrick Foundation. This is actually in Kenya. And what it is, is it's basically an elephant orphanage. Um, in Kenya in particular, there is a lot of poaching. And it's not uncommon for villages to report stranded baby elephants. So the Sheldrick Foundation will take them in and will pair them with a local worker. And they do everything together. They even, oh, it's kind of cut off, but they even sleep together. The elephants are never left alone. And the locals help to rehabilitate the elephants, and then they release them into Savo National Park. It's, so far, it's been pretty successful. It's a pretty long-standing program. It was quite interesting, though. They did find that orphaned elephants are, male orphan elephants are more aggressive than elephants that have not been orphaned. And for a while, there were reports of young orphaned males actually attacking rhino in Savo National Park. Um, so then we have animal attacks on humans. It's not very common, but it does happen. This is a picture of a chimpanzee named Frodo. He's from Gombe National Park. That's where Jane Goodall did her research. And he's been responsible for several attacks on humans, most notably a few years ago when two women were walking on a footpath outside of Gombe National Park. And he sort of came up to them and threatened them. And then he took a baby off of one of the women's backs and climbed up the tree and killed it. Um, but actually, hippos are the most deadly animal in Tanzania. And that is because they're, they're in the water all day during the day, and they feed at night. So at dusk and dawn, when people are out uh, walking along the river, that's when most of the attacks occur. And hippos create what they call hippo highways, which is sort of, you know, they're big animals, so when they go through the bush, they plow everything down and create a nice walking path. So when people are walking along the streams during the day, they obviously want to take the easiest path. So without thinking that there might be a hippo, they take these hippo highways, and then they startle the hippos, and they get between the hippo and the hippo's water source, and that's how a lot of these attacks occur. And then you have a human attack on an animal. Um, as I said before, retaliation is pretty common, but you also get this a lot with poaching. Um, this is a picture of a zebra that's been caught in a snare. And the problem with snare, snares are often used for hunting for subsistence. And the problem with snares are that you can't control what you catch. So if a snare is just a little bit too big or a little bit too small, the animal will get caught in it, but drag it away rather than get stuck. And then it just prolongs the suffering, and the animal ends up dead anyway. Um, what they've tried, since most of these snares are for subsistence farming, what they've tried to do is encourage alternative sources of income. Um, one that has been springing up quite often lately are sort of seed growing operations. So they'll plant these seeds, and then they'll just sell them to whoever wants to buy whatever it may be. And then. There are a lot of microfinance organizations developing that will lend money to women, especially women in rural areas, to start up small businesses like shopkeeping or, in this case, sewing. And those have proven to be pretty successful. So that was human-wildlife conflict. And now you have population growth, which is a really big problem over there. When the country gained its independence in 1961, the population was something like 8 million people. But since then, it's nearly quadruplified. And originally, they didn't really have a need for a wildlife management policy because there weren't enough people to warrant one. But now, with such an increased population, they urgently need to you know, rethink their current policy. Um, there are two reasons for the population increase. The first is cultural factors. In Tanzania, they have traditionally, in the past, they've had a high death rate between all the diseases and the lack of health care. So it was encouraged to have a lot of children. Um, you know, so they could work on your farm, so they could graze your livestock. And they acted sort of as an insurance policy so that when you got older, you'd have people to take care of you. 
uh, but now with all the improved healthcare, people are living longer and um, and more people are being born. People are being born at a faster rate than they're dying. And so what that means is that there are a lot of land use changes. And land use changes altering the land from its original state for any human purpose. And this is creating a lot of pressure on the natural resources. And it's creating a lot of encroachment. This is a picture of Ambasali, or, uh, excuse me, Nairobi National Park. This is in Kenya. And this is actually a national park. You drive through, it's right outside the city. You drive through it and you like look on one side and you have all this wildlife and then you look to your other side and you see the, si the skyscrapers of Nairobi. There's nowhere in Tanzania like this yet, but unless they change their policies, it's bound to happen. Um, and with the population increase, it puts a lot of stress on the natural resources. So this is Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Kilimanjaro is located right near Amboseli National Park and a lot of the region or all of the region gets its water from the snow that runs off the mountain um, through underground springs. So what happens is this is Amboseli National Park and it's well known for its swamps. The elephants come for miles around to go to the swamps. The park itself actually has a capacity, a carrying capacity of 500 elephants but I think that over 1,500 elephants actually pass in and out of there. So it's way above its carrying capacity because elephants love to come here for the swamps. But what's happening is that farmers are, with the increased population, they need to grow more food. So farmers are taking, they're redirecting the rivers into their, into their farms and they're doing a lot of furrow, irriga furrow irrigation which is taking away from the swamps in Amboseli National Park, causing a lot of drought. And in 2008 and 2009, there was a huge drought in the park, or in the area. So the drought combined with all of the water that people are taking away was causing a lot of animal deaths. Um, a lot of the wildlife populations declined significantly during that time. Um, and then you also have the bushmeat crisis. So bushmeat is any type of wild game that is taken from the bush. Um, this is usually for subsistence or for poaching, like selling ivory or horns. Subsistence is run or is driven by a lack of money and a need for food. And then poaching for ivory and horns is driven by money. And a lot of that money comes from the Asian alternative medicine market. They believe that horns and tusks can cure as far as I know, anything, everything. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll shoot the animal and they'll take it down enough to stop it from putting up a fight. They don't really care if it's dead or if it's alive. All they want is to cut out the horn and then they'll leave it there to die. And there's a lot of money in this industry. So I know in the Salu Game Reserve right now, it's actually a pretty dangerous area to go because since there's so much money in poaching, the poachers are equipped with the best tools. They, there have been reports of them using automatic weapons, um, helicopters, night vision. And so their tools and their equipment by far exceed any of the equipment that any of the game, any of the game rangers have. Um, in the Serengeti, they also do, what they do is they'll light a fire in one side of the park and then get all of the park rangers over there and then they'll start poaching in another area. So it's a really big problem right now. And since there's so much money in it, they just they keep getting smarter and smarter and their tools keep getting better and better and the government doesn't pay, doesn't have, feel the need to provide substantial equipment to the park rangers. Um, in, actually last year in Kenya they found a huge stockpile of ivory and they ran DNA tests on it and they traced some of it back to Tanzania and there was this huge debate about what to do with the ivory. Um, they thought about selling it to sort of decrease the demand on the black market they thought about just locking it away and not doing anything with it. But in the end, they decided to burn it and sort of send this message out that, you know, we're not going to stand for this. We have this ivory, but, you know, we're not going to stand for it anyway. We're just going to get rid of it because we don't condone this type of thing. So they did this massive burning of ivory in Kenya last year. Um, and then there's urban expansion and infrastructure development. And by this, I'm referring mostly to roads. And I don't know if you guys ever heard about this, but last year, or for the last couple of years, they were 
trying to build a road through Serengeti National Park, which is where the Great Migration occurs that goes all the way up through here. And the idea behind the road was that it would increase economic activity in here. Um, but the problem with this, well, ecologists thought this would be a really big problem because they thought it would disrupt the migration, it would uh, negatively impact tourism, and it, it would just have all kinds of awful effects on the wildlife and the tourists who come to the park. Um, they decided not to put the road through, but there are some parks that do have roads directly through the middle. This is Makumi National Park, and pretty much to get anywhere in southern Tanzania, you have to drive through this park. And the road is a really big problem because it causes a lot of roadkill. But even, oops, um, even worse than that, it makes it really easy for poachers because they can drive through with their trucks and see an elephant on the side of the road and shoot it and drag it into the truck before anybody even notices they were there. And it makes it really easy for them to just get away without being noticed or stopped. In Kenya, they've tried to, um, they've tried to sort of limit the negative effects of roads on migration patterns by putting these elephant underpasses along major highways. They're pretty new, so they don't know if they're actually working to get the elephants back on their usual migration routes. But this is a picture from inside the underpass, and the elephants are obviously using them. But they're still pretty new. So basically what we're seeing from all these problems are that locals are suffering from the are suffering the negative effects of living with wildlife without getting any of the benefits because the national government is in control of all the resources and they get all the money from the, nat the natural resources. And what's happening right now is a huge uh, power shift. So that's where these wildlife management areas come in. And the idea behind wildlife management areas is to give locals or give villages an opportunity to gain benefits from the wildlife. And what a wildlife management area is, is it's a, it's a um, block of village land that's been set aside for conservation. So it's like a village conservation block. And the idea behind it is villages will fence off an area and they won't allow farming, they won't allow um, wood to be cut down, they won't allow people to live there. And what they'll do is they'll invite tourists in to come look at the wildlife on their land or they'll invite scientists in to come do research with the idea being that they then get to keep the money and the fees generated from inviting these people into their land. Um, and this is Mtuwambu. This is a WMA outside of the Serengeti. And what they've done is they've taken out a loan and they've bought these bikes. So when people go visit the Serengeti, where you can't bike ride, they can make a short stop along the way and bike through this um, this area right on, uh, right on the outskirts of the Serengeti where they can get up close to zebras and elephants and whatever else. And it's proven to be really successful and it sort of started to change the way that locals view wildlife because they're generating money from it. Now they can fund school projects and they can fund their medical clinics. And um, remember when I said before the Maasai are known for their jewelry, it's sort of giving them another opportunity to sell all their products. So it's, it's proven to be pretty successful so far. It's a pretty new concept, but hopefully in a couple of years it will start to take off more. And that's the work I was doing down there. We were outlining where they wanted the boundaries to be, and they also create buffer zones for national parks. So it's a lot of good, good effects, I guess. But. <laughs> <laughs>